You know, it's thanks to romantic novelists that most of us have come away with the impression that smugglers were a jolly band of rosy-cheeked West Country lads who spent their entire professional lives stumbling up and down shingle beaches with nippikins of brandy under each arm and stocking caps on their head, shouting incomprehensible things to each other like, Hurrah, my handsomes, don't you go catching your dang earrings in the rigging? Unfortunately, the reality wasn't quite like that. In fact, smugglers were quite capable of a callous brutality that would take your breath away, literally. Smugglers flooded the kingdom with contraband because import duties put all the life's little luxuries way beyond the reach of ordinary laboring folk, people with their bum hanging out of their britches and all of them selfishly failed to sympathise with His Majesty's complaint that royal revenues were so stretched that he was going to have to sell a palace off. In the meantime, however, the man with the big hat had be coming round, the King's revenue man, who liked nothing better than to come down on smugglers from a very great height. Nah, the grey and grotty North Sea. But you know, in the 17 and 1800s, there was a terrific amount of smuggling activity going on off this very coast, the North Norfolk coast. You see, in those days, ships didn't like to get too far away from the land. No navigation systems worth a damn, so they stayed in close. And in amongst all that shipping were smugglers going backwards and forwards across the North Sea to what we now call Holland, what they call the Low Countries. Because there, the distillery at Shydam, they could get Geneva's gin, brandy, cousin Jackie to me and you, and of course, the thing that everyone wanted the smugglers to bring to England, tea. Everyone except the preventive officers of His Britannic Majesty. Widespread smuggling siphoned off a king's ransom, and some officers watched helpless, but others turned a blind eye for a price. And just a few took it personal. Those so rag little tea leaves think they can make me look a clown. <laughs> They're the ones riding for a fall. Some of the officers who enforced the laws weren't too bothered about breaking them to get a result. They helped turn the old game into a bloody dangerous crime. The fishermen and the seafarers were prepared to take the risk of getting it up the cliffs here, getting it along the lanes inland, taking that risk because they could make some money for themselves by doing that. And they also had a nice little ace in the hole. Practically everyone that lived back from these shores wanted them to succeed. In fact, an awful lot of them were more than willing to lend a hand. Now, just up behind the cliffs at Overstrand, there's a country lane that comes and winds its way past the house of two local benefactresses, Miss Gurney and Miss Buxton. You'll hear more about them in a minute. But the road goes on past their very ornate cottage with its sea view up to the village of North Reps. But on nights when the free traders, the smugglers, were bringing the goods ashore, they didn't stay on the main road. They came this way. A quiet, unpromising little track led off through the woods. And to make doubly sure that no one was going to go poking their snout in where it wasn't wanted, they put about the rumour, the old tale. This was a path used by the devil dog Shuck. I reckon half the ghost stories in Britain started out as smugglers' tales to scare people off and make sure the gentlemen could go by about their unlawful employ without too much let or hindrance. Oh, would you look at this? Beautiful pollard oak, four, five hundred years old, but really important because it's such an obvious landmark in the countryside. The sort of place where smugglers would hide up a couple of packets of tea or a small anchor of brandy and it backs right on to the lady's property, the old cottage. Butter wouldn't melt in their mouth. 
unless it was swilled down with some Lapsang Souchong, courtesy of the local blacksmith. Now, smuggling gangs were often tied in with the local blacksmith. You knew where all the carts and horses were. And the gang in North Reps was led by their local blacksmith, Ted Summers. In 1829, they'd waited all through a long afternoon for the sun to go down because they knew that there was a cargo of Geneva's gin coming in over the strand. Once it was landed, they brought it up this lane into the village. What they didn't know was that the preventive officers were one step ahead of them. Hold it behind this tree up here. I'm surprised. They laid an ambush on either side of this lane. As the smugglers toiled up with their loads, they called on them to surrender. Stand and surrender! Oh no! You're not taking me! No! Please, no, no! Seize that one! And Ted Summers? Well, Ted was somewhere off up this lane, as if old Shop himself were after him. Ted blundered away from the firefight in the thick of the woods and made his way to Sally Bean's cottage. Now, Sally was a popular lady, to say the least. As far as we know, she never went to church door to be married, but she went to church door to bury nine children in the graveyard. So I think it's safe to assume Ted was fairly certain of a warm welcome. Oh, Sally, where is he? I haven't seen him. You ain't seen him, eh? If I find him, he's a dead man. So why am I standing here staring at this beautiful flint and brick wall? Well, somewhere behind it was where Ted once had his foundry. And under cover of darkness that night, when he managed to tear himself away from the tender clutches of Sally, he made his way back. Unfortunately for him, so did the preventive officers. They came within a hair's breadth of catching him on the premises and he took such a fright that as he made his way across the fields making good his escape he decided it was a little too risky to come back here. He spent the next three months, so they say, hiding out in a nearby wood. Whatever it was that he hid up, King's officers never did lay hands on old Ted Summers. He escaped scot-free. Although they will tell you that there was a, a very strange personage of the female gender seen from time to time in the village during the period of his escape. And Sally, bless her, lived to a ripe, brandy-sodden old age, telling her tales through clouds of backy, and never short of a barrel of Cousin Jackie. But well, for all the jokiness that later generations used to soften the tale, two local lads had still been killed, some said murdered. The war was very definitely turning nasty. And it still is a war, and it's as nasty as it ever was. Ask any customs officer in Dover. If you were unlucky enough in this part of the world to be caught the wrong side of the law, they reserved two punishments for you. One took place in the marketplace back in Dover, that was to have, I thought this was a story, an old tale, but it's actually true. They would nail your ear to a post in the marketplace. And having done that, they then put a knife in your hand and leave you with the option of starving to death 
or cutting your own ear off. But it gets worse, because here up on the top of the cliffs is a place called the Bredenstone or Bradenstone. And what used to happen there on the ruins of this old Roman lighthouse was that they would take the poor condemned malefactor, tie his hands together, the why they did that, because he wasn't going to be able to use them, and then heave ho off the top of the cliffs, sailing out with the seagulls down onto the floor below. And if you think the fat boy in the loud shirt is going to treat you to a reenactment, think again. There really were pitched battles in those days. The dragoons were the people who used to go in to support the customs at one stage. They were blatant about what they were doing. Uh, at that stage, you know, there was the thought that the customs had actually lost it. And I think to a certain extent they had because they, they used to get murdered. So if, if, the, if the choice was turning a blind eye or taking a bullet, then the chances are they'd turn a blind eye. But things have changed now because what I think we're managing to do is to get more and more of the public on our side. Do you have any sympathy for smugglers, then or now? No, none at all. Because as a law enforcer, you can't have sympathy for people who are breaking the law. Whatever their reasons for doing it, they are breaking the law. And that's wrong, because it's against society, and we are here to protect society. Yeah. In those days, it was government for the few, by the few. It has changed now, because there's, you know, there's, a, there's a much wider social strata. The government will will use the money that everybody pays to benefit as many as they can. They are criminals, and you've got the money going into their pockets that should be going for yours and my benefit. And it isn't, and that's wrong. And he's right. Back then, the law was used to oppress the likes of us, but nowadays, these fellas are in our employ. Back in the 1700s, there was one gang operating along the entire length of the South Coast, whose name was a byword for terror they committed the most appalling brutalities. The smugglers who did their work by night were known as owlers. Makes sense, doesn't it? And one of the major products that they smuggled, not into England, but out of England, was wool, the woolen fleece, the best fleece in Europe. And one of the places they smuggled it hereabouts was from the sheep on Romney Marsh. And one of the most successful gangs at doing that were the Hawkehurst Gang. In the gang's heyday, this is where their leaders would meet. This was their headquarters, the Mermaid Inn, up the narrow cobbled streets in the town of Rye. Thomas Kingsmill and his associates would sit here with loaded pistols on the table amongst the pint pots. They'd wait while the gang gathered outside, sometimes as many as 500 men, all waiting to take their contraband up to London. On some occasions, they'd actually go through the streets of Canterbury in broad daylight, completely unmolested. That's how confident these guys were. And of course, as well as being successful, they were savage. If you so much as thought about grassing up the gang to the authorities, then you might just wake up with your throat cut one morning. And that would be the Hawkehurst gang's version of letting you off with a caution. Like many another successful business enterprise, the Hawkehurst gang, as they got bigger, began to devour all the smaller gangs. And on one occasion, in 1745, they were operating on such a grand scale that they actually landed 11 and a half tons of tea on the beach. Well, this was gonna need 350 horses to carry it away. They simply didn't have that sort of transport infrastructure. So they got local gangs, coerced local gangs, to come and help them. Now, whether it was a setup or whether things just fell out badly, we don't know. 
but the Folkestone gang, poor souls, came here, found themselves involved in a row on the beach with the Hawkehurst gang, who simply saw them off. I mean, let's face it, they weren't going to go head to head with the worst gang on the coast. And they made their way off the beach, leaving 40 of their horses to be stolen by the Hawkehurst mob. They obviously had a, a very interesting way of doing business. Their reign of terror was spread along the entire length of the south coast. So in order to help us picture what that was like, we've arranged to go up in a helicopter and make that journey along their territory. You must be joking. Oh. Uh, back to plan B then. Now, the Hawkehurst gang had a chain of influence that extended from the very walls of Dover Castle up above the cliffs, right the way along the coast, across the Romney Marshes, under the shadow of the Martello Towers, Rye, which you know all about, where their little headquarters, and their main headquarters down at Hawkehurst, where the ringleaders lived. No, 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 not supposed to tell you about that. Goudhurst comes later. Bit of a cliffhanger. Hastings, shoom! Beachy head. Well, I wish you could see this. Beautiful cliff. Artistry in this, you know, artistry. Isle of Wight and Portsmouth, places to be avoided because of the tides and the winds and the fact that the whole area is awash with revenue and preventative men. Pool in Dorset, the Customs House. You're going to hear all about that story in a minute. There wasn't a cove or a landfall anywhere along this coastline that these guys didn't know about and would use if need arose. Right the way down to Land's End. I'm not going down there again, I'm knackered. But the one place that nobody wanted to go, as far as the Hawkehurst gang was concerned, was here to London. See? Tower of London. Because if they were caught, they were brought to trial in the capital. And if they were found guilty, more often than not, they made the journey west to where we get the expression from, someone's gone west. They made the journey out along the Great West Road, past what's now Marble Arch, to Tyburn, where many a smuggler danced the Tyburn hornpipe. But there was an occasion when the Hawkers gang did go west, all the way to Dorset, to Poole Harbour. And it wasn't to prat about in a powerboat. To say that the Hawkers gang were blatant is a, a massive understatement. Barefaced arrogance doesn't even begin to describe the, the total lack of respect that they had for the forces of law and order. They came here through the back streets of Poole, past the warehouses, down the narrow lanes to the quayside. They came in the usual style for these events, gang-handed and tooled up. And damn your eyes, cool as you please, they forced open the doors to the customs house, went inside and took what they believed was rightfully theirs, loaded it up onto their carts, and without a buy your leave or even stopping to buy the customs officers a drink, took it off back to Sussex. Two men died as a result of that jaunt. Daniel Chater, a Fordingbridge man who was coerced into giving evidence against the raiders, and William Galley, the preventive officer who was sent to escort him to Chichester. The gang captured them in an inn at Rowland's Castle, battered, bludgeoned and tortured them, and when Galley was dead, they dug him a shallow pit at the side of the road. When they dug it, they cut the body down from the horse and threw it into the grave, and then began to back kill it. And you might think that there was an end to his suffering. But several weeks later, when customs officers came to retrieve the body, as they very tenderly carefully dug it out. They found that their friend had a mouth full of soil and his hands were up trying vainly to cover his face and push off the earth that was being piled in on top of him. In a last act of callous brutality, the Hawkehurst gang had buried him alive.
mind you, the Hawkehurst gang didn't always have it all their own way. Far from it. In fact, one place they came badly unstuck was here, in the village of Goudhurst. Now, there came a day when the great and the good of the village of Goudhurst decided they'd had quite enough of the Hawkehurst gang, thank you very much. They paid an ex-soldier to train them how to fight. From then on, it'd be Brown Bess and a 14-inch bayonet if the gang came this way again. Well, they came, and I kid you not, it was the Magnificent Seven on the streets of Goudhurst. The hard men of the Hawkehurst gang entertained an extraordinarily low opinion of the Goudhurst militia, and they came here to teach them a lesson. Unfortunately, they were the boys who took the cane in. The militia had fortified this whole area around the churchyard, and when the Hawkehurst boys came up the hill, they had their lads placed behind the gravestones, in trenches, up on the balconies and in the windows. The Hawkehurst gang jeered at them and opened fire. The Goudhurst militia popped up from their defences and poured a thick, heavy, fierce fire back into them. The Hawkehurst gang couldn't believe what was going on. They reeled back and then stood there exchanging volley for volley with the boys inside the churchyard. And because they were out in the open, they came off worst. As they started to back down the hill, the Goudhurst boys saw their chance. They burst out of their defences, went roaring down the street, out for blood, and the Hawkehurst gang were sent, chased back the way they came, leaving their dead and their wounded and their prisoners behind them. They never came here again. <laughs> 